Good morning, everyone. I'm Aribal. Awesome. Um, before I start, uh, how many of you have used Kubernetes? How many of you have used Kubernetes in production environments? OK, so we all f share the same pain. <laughs> Um, today I'll talk about um, pods. Pod, is, uh, as we all know, pods is one of the basic building blocks of Kubernetes. And just to introduce myself, my name is Chetan Shivshankar, and I work as a Kubernetes tech lead at Pocona. I have around 14 years of experience. Uh, my experience spans through the build and release engineering, the SRE, uh, and the DevOps profile. So right now, I'm working at Pocona to build an awesome product called DBAS. Uh, it's based on the operators for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. So the plan is to provide the database as a service on these three database variations. And by the way, this is a working custom resource as long as you have the CRD, so it will work. So uh, when I was a kid, I used to have this magnifying glass, and I used to burn that small piece of paper by trying to focus the sunlight. But today, hope I'll do something different and better. Um, in this talk, we will talk about what is a pod in the context of D, because nowadays there are so many projects. And uh, we'll make it simple by just going through one of them. And uh, we will try to magnify from the higher level of Kubernetes cluster all the way down to you know, like the basic building of the pods and the containers. So how it all started was uh, when I was wanted to explore pods, the first thing you know, like every software engineer does, I tried to search Google for what is a pod, and then what are the internals of pods. I didn't get any satisfactory results, so then I tried to go into the github.com, try pod, try, try to get any details on how it works. But all I got ended up was the pod specs, which to be honest, didn't give much information. So that's why I started to learn and explore more about pods. And uh, I thought like to put up a presentation which kind of gives a high level overview rather than you know like going through many multiple stuff and collating it. So what is a Kubernetes cluster in a very simplified way? All you have is a control plane and you will have a set of worker nodes which are constantly communicating. Uh, to the control plane. And then you have a kubelet, which is nothing but a simple process which is running on a worker node, which is constantly communicating with the you know, API server. And kubelet ensures that pod runs on a specified node or whichever it's, it's scheduled on. So let's take the glass and you know, try to see what actually happens on a worker node. So worker node is, could be a physical machine or a virtual machine or whatever. All it's basically is like, you know, you have a operating system running on top of it. And you have a kubelet, which is a process. And you have a bunch of processes which is running on the operating system, right? And container runtime is also one of them. In this case, we will take an example of container D. So basically, container uh, runtime will have something like a container runtime interface plugin, which is actually an interface to you know have a communication between you know the kubelet and the CRA, which makes this kind of you know the container runtime pluggable. You know you can have something like a container D, and you know you can replace it something with CRIO or something like that. So that's the advantage. So this container runtime manages the containers, or essentially the pod. I'll come exactly on what the pod is, but you know for now let's assume that you know container runtime actually manages the container. So the next question is, what is a container? A uh, container is a mechanism where you actually ship your application and all the dependencies along with it in, in a, like a small you know, uh, shippable uh, stuff. Uh, essentially, uh, with that, you don't need to worry about you know, uh, packaging all the dependencies and all the stuff. All you have to do is get your container and run it, and you know, it will start working as you expect. But on a machine, Container is nothing but a simple process. It's just a simple process. Like, uh, you know, the kubelet or a container runtime and all those stuff. And how do the container gets its unique qualities is, you know, 
with its own C groups, the namespaces, and the file systems. We will talk about what it is, but uh, this is a high level overview of like what a container is. So let's zoom into the container. So uh, when you want to use a virtual machine or, or a physical machine or something, right? The first thing you always want to do is, you know, you, you need to have some resources. You don't want something, you know, like I just have like uh, a couple of vCPUs or, you know, I need some 10 vCPUs or something. You need a mechanism where your machine will get some resources. And the second thing is assume somebody uh, on, some, on their machine is doing something and all of a sudden your SSH terminal or whatever breaks when you're you know, debugging a production cluster. Just because you know, whatever they did, it's affecting you. It's not the ideal way, right? You should have some sort of isolation. What you should be doing on your container should be totally independent of what happens on the other container. So you need an isolation. And the other case could be you are working on something, all of a sudden your machine breaks. It just stops working because somebody else did like an RM minus RF root. Okay, you did it, but why it's affecting me? So you should have that proper isolation, right? So that's where you know container comes in where uh, you have a way to allocate and restrict the system resources to the containers, and that is managed through C groups. And you have a way to isolate the resource from one container to other. So that's possible with namespaces, and each container has its own file system. It's kind of, you know, like, uh, even if somebody does the RM minus RF root, right, it affects their container, not yours. So it's like you need to have a mechanism where it's completely different. So <clears throat> let's talk about um, control groups. So C groups is basically a Linux kernel feature, uh, which is managed through a pseudo file system. And the pseudo file system is actually, in general, it's sys FSC group. Like in whichever Linux machine you go, it's like, you know, it should be like sys FSC group. And it's hierarchical in nature. It means, uh, the simplest example to check is just check out the buckets. Assume you have a big bucket, which is like capacity of 10 liters, and you start trying to flow, I mean, pour the water into the buckets, the smaller buckets. So no matter whatever you do, the capacity of the buckets is just 10 liters. Like even if you pour the full or the half of it, it cannot exceed, the smaller buckets cannot exceed 10 liters because you only have like 10 on the top, top bucket. Similarly, if you come to the second level of the buckets, if you have some five liters, no matter whatever you do, you cannot pour more than five liters um, into the lower buckets. So that's like a hierarchical in nature. And then um, C groups also provides a mechanism to allocate resources. You know, like you can mention like how many liters of water this bucket can go in. Like, okay, I need to place a bigger bucket or I need to place a smaller bucket. That you can do it with control groups. Or you can also do like, you know, some processes might not need to access some specific devices or specific users. You can also control this with C groups. Uh, some of the resources which can be managed by C groups are like um, CPU, memory, the block IO, the process IDs, and all the stuff. And there are some things like IDMA and NUMA, which probably I will never use it in my life. So. But yeah, they're also managed by control groups. And the second thing is, um, like I told, right, every container should have its own file system. How do we manage it? How, how can we make it possible? So any container is actually a, basically a set of image layers. So when you actually pull a container, you're pulling a set of layers, I mean container images. So what you actually do is when you run a container, it creates a thin read light layer on top of all the stack read, read layers. So as you can see, right, there is a set of the four layers which are blue in color. They're all read only. So these are like a standard reference. So assume I have a Ubuntu image and I'm running several containers depending on this Ubuntu. I don't need to have this Ubuntu image like five, four or five times. All I need to do is have a single uh, a layer, so I mean single set of Ubuntu image layers, 
And the system will just allocate a thin read light layer so that you know each container has its own write layer. And whatever operations or whatever the write things, I mean write operations it does, it's completely exclusive to that container. And uh, we also manage it by, you know, each container will get its own root file system. Uh, this is actually, you know, kind of, you know, possible with namespaces and also uh, storage drivers like overlay to better FS and all that stuff. So, uh, ideally, the mechanism is either you have something like a union overlay file system or, you know, you have something like a snapshot based systems. So, in that, you can actually get uh, each container having its own file system. Um, how many of you have uh, used the uh, BSD JL zone or the change root, CH root? So I think probably you have been very uh, familiar with this, right? So with CH root, you have a mechanism where you have a process and uh, you provide a mechanism so that you know that process has its own root file system. Um, basically, what it means is you see uh, two different colored nodes, right? There are the white ones and the blue ones. So the white ones are the ones which you actually see the file system on the node itself. But the blue ones are the one where you know you have a fork from the you know like the main system, and what you see it is as a container. So the container sees everything from the node slash a slash b, and all its child are like c two and c one. But on the parent node, it's actually a path like slash a slash b slash d. Similarly, if there is a container which is running on slash a slash c, it's totally different from the container which is running on slash a slash b. So you have a different file system. So no matter whatever you do, uh, the container on the blue one cannot see outside of slash a slash b. So it's restricted. So you have a proper isolation. And then, uh, what is the namespace? So again, Linux, uh, namespace is a Linux kernel feature. Uh, it provides a mechanism to isolate the resources by process. I mean, like, I have a process, there are a couple of processes, and each process needs to have its own set of resources, right? For that, uh, we use something called as a namespace. It's kind of simulating a virtual machine where, you know, you, the container or a process has its own stuff, and whatever is being done is not being reflected in another container. And one of the most popular known, you know, way to get a namespace is, you know, probably the command unshared. Uh, the types of namespaces which are actually supported are, you know, like, we have the list, right? So some of them are like the mount namespace, so which provides the ability for each processes to have their own mount file system. Then there's UTS namespace, which is like, you know, used to have like its own host name. The system uh, IPC namespace, where, you know, uh, with this it's possible to have its own, you know, like semaphores and uh, the shared memory process and all this stuff. Um, the network namespace and the PID namespace, you know, where like each process has its own subset of processes uh, underneath it. Then there's a user namespace, which means like each process will have their own set of users. Uh, then there's C group namespace and there's a time namespace. So these are the some set of namespaces supported by the, you know, like pretty much like most of the Linux systems. So what actually happens when you create a board? You have something like a Kubernetes client, which is kube control or a program or whatever, right? Like you initiate the program. And then the first thing what it will do is it will connect to the control plane, ideally the API server. So the control plane could be anything like you know, EKS or GKE or you know, it could be something like a self-management like COPS or Kubernetes. What it does is, is this actually talks to the kubelet to ensure the pods runs on specific nodes. And then the kubelet actually in this context talks with container D using CRI so that you know like there's a communication happening between you know, container D and kubelet. So the container D uses some a process called shim. So shim is a very simple program. So basically the idea is to you know uh, isolate all the container management stuff or decouple the things from actual container D binary to something you know uh, independent of it. So the purpose is assume you have like 100 containers and if you're managing everything through one container D binary, right? Like I mean like one process. 
uh, if there is something wrong and you need to you know like restart container D process or whatever, like you need to manage it, you're pretty much you know affecting all the hundred containers. So you need a mechanism to you know decouple it, and also there needs to be a process you know to handle like the file descriptors, right? So Shim does the job. Um, so the container D actually doesn't create all the C groups and namespaces, but it relies on something like a lower level binary like run C. So run C is the one which is like the you know real understated hero, which actually kind of creates the container. It manages the C groups, the namespace, and all those stuff. So with run C, you get the containers. Uh, so if you're already wondering, the talk is about pod. What are we talking so much about containers means? I'm getting there. <laughs> so what is actually a pod? Uh, pod is basically an abstract of one or more containers. So in general, um, if you run a pod, right, you will have something like, you know, in this case, let's assume I'll, I'm running a pod with a couple of containers, container one and container two. Uh, in general, the system will actually attach something like a pass container. So the role of pass container is very simple. All it does is, you know, uh, it, it establishes a namespace and, you know, it provides a way for other processes to come and attach its own namespaces. So you have a mechanism to manage it rather than, you know, like each process is managing all the stuff, right? You have an easy interface where, you know, um, the other processes or the container comes and attached to the one, and the pass process is like uh, ever running, you know, like while loop, which also reaps the zombies and all those stuff. So you have the additional benefits. So when you run a container with, uh, when you run a pod with a couple of containers, so the container one and container two, and also the pass container, will actually share the same time namespace. And it will also share the same network space, the IPC namespace, the UTC namespace, the C group namespace, and also the user namespace. This is in general. Um, and uh, you have an option to choose whether if you want to share the same PID namespace or if you want to isolate it. So by default, the PID namespace is different between the containers of a pod. But you have an option to you know, make it same. Like we will go through that in the demo. And for sure, each of the container has its own namespace, the mount namespace. Otherwise, you know, everything will be having, you know, like the same mounts and all those stuff, and it's such a mess. So let's run to the demo. So for the demo, I'll take a very simple example. I'm running this pod called demo pod. And all it does is it has a couple of containers, which is an Alpine container and an Nginx container. In the Alpine, in the Alpine container, all I'm doing is, you know, I'm just telling I'm printing a message called looping. And I'm doing it every five seconds and looping, just to tell that, OK, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. So you do this, let's ignore all the things which are commented out. So, Uh, by the way, is the screen visible, or should I make the font more better, bigger? It's fine. Awesome. So what I'll do is I'll just create a pod. OK. So it has got, it is running on a specific node. So we'll go into the actual node and see what's happening. I'll go as a root. OK, so the first thing I'll do is, like I told, right, container is nothing but a set of process, you know, like pod. So first thing I'll do is, I did run an Nginx, right? So the Nginx process is actually you know, reflecting on the host node. And the second thing is not actually an Alpine, but the sleep command, which I am using it for in the Alpine image. Uh, you can see a very familiar similarity that, you know, this was the root process, and the parent of is 27308, which is the same as the one for the sleep process, which is also 27308. 
So let's see what's that process. That 27.3.0.8 is actually, you know, like the container D shim. Like I told, right, the container D will actually spawn a process and ensure that the container D shim takes care of all the required things, right? And that shim actually spawns a first container and then the other two containers, right, the Nginx and the Alpine container gets attached to it. So that's why you see like the three different processes and they have the same root. So let's check what's actually happening in this namespace. Uh, as we know, like any process in the Linux, right, will have its entry in the you know, slash proc um, zero file system. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to go into the each container slash proc slash okay so you can see here right like uh, these are the namespaces associated with these three processes which is actually a container. Uh, like you see, the, the C group namespace is same for all of them. The IPC name is similarly say, same for all of them. That's the 854, that's the 854, and that's the 854. And mount space is different for each one of them. You see here, it's like 852. Here it's 856. Here it's 858. So it's actually using a different month namespace. And the network namespace is common. Again, the 979797. The PID namespace is different now just because we have opted it to be different, like which is by default. So the PID namespace of this is different. And this 857 is different. And 859 is different. The rest of the namespaces are same for all the containers, like the time namespace, the user namespace, and the UTS namespace. Um, now we got an overview of namespace. Let's see how it actually reflects on the C group level. Um, so like I told, uh, all this uh, you know, C group file, you know, pseudo file system is in slash says FS C group. And these are the resources which are actually you know, supported by the C group. I believe this is like C group V2. Um, so you have something like a block IO, CPU, divisor, C group, the freezer, memory, you know, and the, I think the huge transition to cassette buffer, buffy event, PIDs, like there's so many things. So I think one of the easiest things to look in is like what's a memory. So we will go to the memory. Um, here you can see, right, like there are so many slices. By default, uh, Kubernetes always creates the pod under uh, something called as slice. You see here, right, that's why you have all this slice. And um, the quality of service in Kubernetes provides three different mechanisms. One is the you know, best and the best effort and the burstable. For this pod, we have not specified any resources. So it comes under the best effort category. So if I go to the best effort, I see this, okay, pod. Okay, I see a couple of them. So what I can do is keep control, get old JSON pod. So basically I'm trying to get the UID So this is pod AE911694B. So this is the one which is actually the demo pod. I'll exit this. So how it actually happens is, you know, the Kubernetes takes the pod ID and in general uh, and uses it for, you know, creating the uh, C groups. So I'll go to this pod double A double E one. And then you'll have the containers. So you see, like, you have, like, 
uh, all the stuff which I know like all the memory entries are related for the pod, but you also have the subdirectories, right? These are actually for the containers running within it. Like I told, right, it's actually a hierarchy. So, you know, you have a bigger bucket, which is the pod, and you have the smaller buckets, you know, which are the containers. So, uh, there's also another way, easier way to check what's a C group, but I'll show the, you know, the complicated one. So, uh, C CTR, I'm using something like, I you know, the container D client. And I'll just check for what is there for the Nginx. So you see, this is the container name. And if I go to this, so there are, again, a lot of entries related to this, you know, the C groups. The one thing which I can check, which is pretty easy, is like, you know, the cat memory limit underscore bytes. As you can see, right, there's no cap for it. It's like a very huge number. So by default, if you don't allocate or, you know, specify the limits, right, it's by default, you know, it's a kind of, okay, run it till the node can take it. And similarly, you know, you have other directories where, you know, all this stuff, like this is, ideally this could be a pass container and this could be an Alpine container. So this is how the actual C groups reflects into the, you know, like the host system. Uh, I'll also do a small change um, in the pod.ml. What I'll try to do right now this time is, okay, before that I'll also share, show this thing. I'll try to exec into the Alpine container. So I'm actually executing into the Alpine container. And if I do a PS minus EF, so all the process which I'm seeing is just related to the sleep. That's the only thing which I'm running here. I can't see the Nginx or I can't see the pause or anything because you know I have like different PID namespaces. So right now what I'll do is um, I'll modify this pod.yaml to share the name, uh, process namespace and what I'll do is I'll also add the limits for both the containers. So before that, I'll remove the pod, which is there, just to, okay. So now I'll apply the new pod. If I see here, it has got some nodes, so let's go into this. Okay, we are in. Again, the basic thing is, easiest way, check the Nginx process, get the PID, check the sleep process because we are running sleep with Alpine, right? Get the PID. And let's see what actually happens, you know, when we share the PID namespace, right? So again, we'll check what's proc. ns slash proc slash ns. Uh, okay, I'll do this. It should be. And I'll also, just to make it simple, I'll just check the PID one. You can see here, right? Right now, these two containers are actually sharing the same PID namespace because while we specified the shared namespaces is equal to true in the pod spec, you're actually having this, you know, that uh, shared PID is actually reflected onto the actual host. And um, let's see, we also added a memory, right? Like maximum limit of 200 MB. So let's see how it actually works in this. So what I'll do is, 
uh, this is a simpler way. Um, each process will have something like a C group entry, right? So 30375 slash C group. So I can easily uh, hop through this using this stuff. Where is the memory? Yes. I can take this path. Again, uh, if I need to traverse, it's always from the, you know, like the C group uh, parent, C group. Then I'm, I need to check for the memory C group, right? So I go into this, then I go into the actual directory. So if I do something like cat memory limit underscore bytes, I see a different value. It's not the one huge, right? If I want to know actually what it is, I'll just see, like, you know, this is in bytes. 1024 by 1024. You know, this is a 200 MB. If you remember, this was the value which uh, we used in the pod specification. We are pod.ml, right? You see here, right? This was the value, which is this was like, you know, 200 MB. Even for the Nginx, we used 200 MB. This is how it got reflected. And as this is hierarchical, right? So this is the memory value for the container. And if I go one level deep back, and if I check cat memory limit underscore bytes, and if I calculate the actual value, Thousand twenty-four by thousand twenty-four. It's four hundred MB because the pod added the val. I mean the limits of both the containers, and you know no matter whatever happens, you know this cannot exceed this. Um, and the other important thing is we need to see how actually the namespaces is shared. Uh, we saw when we checked into the Alpine container, right? Uh, it was only, we were only able to see the sleep process. But let's see what happens when we, you know, share the namespaces. TI, the demo pod, minus C, demo Alpine. You can see the difference, right? Right now, this container can also see the pass process, and it can also see the Nginx process, because all of the containers in the pod are sharing the na uh, same PID namespace, because we configured it to be that way. OK, so. This was the demo, and just to conclude, you know, like pod is an abstract of one or more containers. You have C groups, the namespace and file system, which actually are the building blocks of the containers. The containers of a pod will obviously should have different mount namespaces because you know that's how it can have its own file system and all this stuff. The container of the pod might or might not share the namespaces. It all depends on the configuration which we have used. And in general, all the rest of the namespaces should be the same. And um, container D also spawns a shim process, which also manages a lot of other things, you know, like containers using you know low-level runtime like Run C. Uh, that's it from my end. I hope you had a good time, and I'm open for questions if there are any. I'm always reachable on my, you know, you can also reach me on LinkedIn or uh, my email ID. So if there are no questions now also, I'm always reachable.